I'm here with Dr. Romano to do part two of the general chemistry exam. Hi, I'm Dr. Romano, a professor of organic chemistry here at Romano Scientific and the author of the Orgo Man books and the creator of the Dat Destroyer. I'm going to continue on with this exam. We've gone over some questions. This is going to be part two. We've done some calculations involving limiting reagents. We've done some stoichiometry problems, a little ratio problems, and percent composition. So things will get easier though. This exam will be getting much easier when we get to the theory part. So come along and let's see what we got. Now, on number 47, it says water has a higher boiling point than compounds of similar molecular weights. And what explains this? The fact that water has such an abnormally high boiling point is due to choice A, extensive hydrogen bonding that exists between the water molecules. For example, I wrote to you that H2S has a molecular weight of 34, and H2S is a gas. Water is 18, so certainly you would think water is a gas as well, but water we know is a liquid, and as you can see, the hydrogen bonding that would exist causes water to behave as what we call an associated liquid. So instead of having one molecule, it's a whole bunch of molecules put together. Now, hydrogen bonding would explain properties such as high boiling point for water, high melting point. It would explain things like high heat of vaporization. It would explain things like high viscosity, um, stuff like that. Um, even high surface tension. Now remember, the boiling point of water is high, vapor pressure would be low. Always a question. If we look at some of the wrong choices, it says that B, one of the isotopes of hydrogen is deuterium, and it's present in significant quantities to alter the boiling point. Not true. Water has hydrogen that weighs 1 AMU, 99.99%. So only less, around 0.01% would be heavier hydrogen isotopes. So that's silly. Water is polar covalent. That's true, but that doesn't explain why there is such an abnormally high boiling point. You can be polar covalent and not be so high in boiling point. Van der Waals forces are between all molecules, but that surely doesn't explain why water is such abnormally high. And then it says water is largely dissociated, um, leading to large electrostatic forces. That's not true. If you remember it, in a water solution, um, an aqueous solution, we would only see a very small amount of hydronium and hydroxide, one to the minus seventh. So the best answer is choice A, the H bonding. In 48, it says that a substance is non-conducting as a solid and it melts at 750 Celsius. The melt conducts electricity and the solid is observed to be water soluble. This is classified as choice B, an ionic compound. Ionic compounds have very, very high melting points, sometimes into the thousands. Um, and they only conduct electricity when in the molten or aqueous state. So that explains an ionic compound. A metallic compound, would, we know metals are conducting, so that's out. A polymeric substance could have a high melting point, sometimes low melting point, but 750 seems a little too high, and besides, not all polymers conduct electricity. So that doesn't sound so nice. Molecular solid could be like sugar. That's a great example, and we all know sugar... Um, surely doesn't melt at such a high melting point. So that, and then it's also sugar does not conduct electricity. Macromolecular is another word. You might say, well, what the devil is macromolecular? A good example would be like a protein or a nucleic acid. A protein surely wouldn't be melting at no 750, for God's sakes. Proteins begin to denature, say, in the human body after 40 degrees Celsius. So that's plain silly. Best answer is choice B. Okay, let's go to the next one. In the next example, it says here on 49, how many grams of NaOH 
and the weight is given as 40, are there in 25 mLs of a 0.4 molar NaOH solution? Well, if you come over here and I write down the molarity is equal to the moles of the solute divided by the liters of the solution. So let's plug in. The molarity is given as 0.4. We now know the moles. The liters is given as 250 mLs, which is 0.250. So this is a quarter times 0.4 is 0.1 moles of the NaOH. And they want grams. So you take the 0.1 moles. We know that moles are on the bottom. There's 40 grams of NaOH in a mole, and that gives me four grams, which is choice letter C. So that was an easy one. It's a short back question. Make sure you do the ones in the New Death Destroyer. The questions are much more challenging than that. Question number 50. This is a dilution problem. It says which will be the final volume when 400 milliliters a 0.6 molar HCl is diluted to 0.5 molar HCl. What I do for dilutions, I write the formula M, molarity initial, volume initial, is molarity final, volume final. So let's see what the initial molarity is. As you can see, it's 0.6. And I'm going to stay in milliliters. That's 400 mLs. And then... We're diluting it to 0.5, and we want V final. So it's going to be 0.6 times 400 over 0.5 is V final, and that would be choice letter C. That's an easy one. All right. Next question is a hard one. Now, it says here that during the titration, during a titration, it was determined that 30 milliliters a 0.100 molar of tetravalent cerium solution was required to react completely with 20 mLs of the divalent iron at 0.150 molar. And which reaction occurred? Now, here's the best way to do this problem. We know that molarity times liters is moles. So if you converted this into liters, it's O30. If you, and if you see what I wrote down here for you, if you multiply those liters by the molarity, that gives me moles. So we get 0, 0, 0,030 moles of tetravalent cerium. You do the same thing to the divalent iron. You multiply the mLs by the molarity, and you get OO30. And there it is. You can see it's a one-to-one -one relationship. And it says it reacts completely. So we're looking for a reaction that shows a one-to-one -one relationship. Choice C shows that relationship where there's one mole of the cerium plus four, one mole of the iron plus two, and also, if you look, the charges on both sides of the equation are balanced. Correct answer is choice C. Next question. In this next question, I say to you, 25 mLs of a 0.5 molar NaOH neutralizes 35 mLs of a monoprotic acid. What is the molarity of the acid? Now, if monoprotic acid, if monoprotic acid, and if dibasic, meaning there's one OH, so one OH, one H, one H, you can say molarity of the acid times the volume of the acid is the molarity of the base times the volume of the base. I want you to go to the Dat Destroyer book and look at some other examples where they're a lot trickier than this. I'm not going to get into the trickier one, but I want you to look in the Destroyer and I'll make a tape up on it. But this one's simple. Now, if you just took a quick glance at these numbers, the 35 looks like it was converted into liters. Notice I see a whole bunch of O35s and 25s are O25, so I'm going to work in liters. So I'm going to first go to the molarity of the acid. We don't know, so I don't know that. The volume of the acid, it says, is 35 mLs, 
which is O35. All right, molarity of the base is 0.5. The volume of the base is O25. So solving, we get the 0.5, the O25, divided by O35. And that would be choice letter A. But like I said, I want you to go back and I want you to look at some more trickier questions on that. More on that, but in this question, that was straightforward. All right, in the next question, we want to know, in which reaction is water considered to be acting as an acid? Remember, acids give off H plus ions. None of the other ones show that. For example, if you go to choice letter D, if water gives off an H, it would give you the NH4 plus and OH minus. Hopefully, you can see that. And all the other ones just would be wrong for the sake of being wrong. For example, if you look at B, water is not giving off an H, but water is accepting an H. And if you looked here, it's the same thing. Water is accepting an H. The only one that's showing water is giving off an H would be in choice letter D. Okay, that was real easy. At constant temperature... When the following reactions involving gases are at equilibrium, which reaction shifts to the right if the pressure is increased? All right, if you go over to here, we have 2H2 gas plus O2 gas gives 2H2O, and they're telling me everything's a gas. What I would do is to count up the volumes you have now. We remembered PV equals NRT. Now, I'm hoping you can see that volume is proportional to moles. So if I say on this side of the equation, you have two moles and one mole is three moles, instead of saying three moles, I'm going to say three volumes of gas. So notice I'm going to use that interchangeably with moles. And here... There is two volumes, which is two moles. Now, just remember Boyle's law. Pressure goes up, volume goes down. Pressure goes down, volume goes up. So what we want to do is which shifts it to the right. So you want to shift it towards lower volume. Lower volume means higher pressure. So as you can see, that would work. If the pressure is increased, the volume will decrease and it would move to the right side for the correct answer. If you look, for example, at choice D, there's two volumes of gas on the left and two volumes on the right, so pressure would have no effect. If you go to choice B, there's two volumes of gas on the left and four volumes of gas on the right. So that means if pressure goes up, goes up, the volume would go down and it would shift to the left. So that's why those choices would be wrong. Only in choice A, as I said, the smaller volume is on the right side. So as the pressure went up, you would bring it into a smaller volume container. There's a lot of questions like that that I want you to look at in the destroyer. Okay. Okay, Dr. Romano, why don't we do a part three of this video? All right, we'll do a part three on the video in the next segment. Okay.